Hello, everybody. Welcome to Miss McGuire online video lecture. And today we are covering the central nervous system. So I will go ahead and pick up my pen. So the central nervous system composed of a uh, brain. Oh, I'm sorry. Where is my... So it's composed of a brain that protected by skull and a spinal cord protected by vertebral column. Um, so here you see the lateral view and posterior view of the brain and spinal cord. So here's the brain inside the cranial cavity and skull is a bony structure that protects it. And here's your spinal cord that is inside of vertebral uh, cavity. And... Um, uh, vertebra protects it. Um, so brain and spinal cord is made up of gray matter, that is cell bodies and dendrites of neurons, and white matter that include myelinated axons. I just um, want to remind you that if you would draw um, a neuron, right, so, um, so you would draw a cell body, and cell body has all this you know, nucleus and organelles. And then we have axon, right? And axon is covered by this myelin sheath. And then you have multiple dendrites here. A bit more. Um, so, um, so now this uh, cell body and dendrites that make a gray matter. And this axon and myelin sheath, so myelinated axon makes white matter. Okay, so let's just uh, remove all this stuff. Um, so we're gonna look at adult brain and adult brain has four um, main regions include Cerebrum, so this is this the biggest part. Uh, diencephalon, um, so it's um, oh I'm sorry, it's this one. This uh, only this purple part, so it's inside. It's covered by cerebrum. So this purple part here, that's a diencephalon. Um, cerebellum, um, so here's this inferior part of the brain, and brain stem. So brain stem is this that has three different green colors. So here, uh, brain stem, and brain stem is made of three parts, midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. So this is a uh, four main region of adult brain, cerebrum, diencephalon, cerebellum, and brain stem. Um, now brain um, is protected by uh, membrane, membranes called meninges. Meninges are three protective layers surround the brain and spinal cord, right? So that's what meninges are. Fluid uh, flowing between meninges is called cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. A function of um, CSF is cushioning and protect, uh, cushion and protect a CNS against outside blow that uh, would cause damage. Um, so you see the brain um this is mid sagittal section and of course this is uh, will be a skin then a bone of um, cranium and here's a brain right and we have a meninges so we have a covering like pia covers the oh we will talk about it more but a pia matter covers the surface of the brain then we have arachnoid matter and in subarachnoid space, we have cerebrospinal fluid. So it shows this nice blue color. And then uh, we have this uh, show in uh, purple is a uh, dura. So this is our meninges. Um, so what is, um, so here's we have some uh, trauma to the, uh, to, to the brain. And uh, one of the function of cerebrospinal fluid and meninges to protect it from this from happening. So concussion is a traumatic brain injury that changes the way your brain function. The brain is made up of soft tissue that is protected by blood and spinal fluid. When the skull is jolted too fast 
or is impacted by something. The brain shifts and hits again the skull, right? So over here, let's say this is a wall and uh, you, you hit your head and your brain will hit the bone and it will co uh, cause concussion. Now, concussion is a temporary um, brain injury and uh, it will go away but it can lead uh, it it can lead to bruising and swelling of the brain tearing blood vessels and injury to nerves causing the um uh, 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 causing this concussion most concussions are mild and can be treated with appropriate care but left untreated it can be deadly there is another um, trauma called contusion that's when we have a permanent brain uh, damage uh, after trauma so here's our meninges um so definition um oh i'm sorry meningitis so iris means inflammation so definition infection of meninges caused by virus bacteria or fungi symptoms include headache fever stiff neck causes a inflammation of meninges uh prevention Vaccines might prevent some uh, version of uh, meningitis. And a diagnosis, a spinal tap is used to check the cerebrospinal fluid for decrease in sugar and increase in white blood cells. Um, so uh, because we have those meninges that we just mentioned right over here, so that's a normal meninges. And here's the meningitis, when we have inflammation of meninges and it can uh, be passed to the brain tissue. Now, this is the spinal fluid, show you how spinal fluid is collected uh, uh, from the low part of the um, vertebral cavity. And then it will be tested on increase of white blood cells that shows there is some inflammation. That uh, will be our diagnosis. Uh, now we're gonna look at uh, brain and cerebrum is the largest portion of the brain. It's a center to receive integrate and communicate voluntary motor responses, skeletal muscle movement. Cerebrum is divided by central line. So this line right here, it's called longitudinal fissure. And it's divided into two hemispheres. Uh, longitudinal fissure produces two halves of cerebrum called cerebral hemisphere. However, you don't want um, your brain be completely uh, separated into right and left brain. You want uh, some communication between uh, those lobes and you have a um, structure called corpus callosum. So two halves communicate through extensive nerve bridge called corpus callosum. So that's the ones that allow information grows, uh, go to, from left to right and from right to left. Um, so here's our um, left and right uh, brain function. So some of this function uh, varies. Um, so this is called lateralization. So they believe that left brain function include analytic thoughts, logic, language, science, and math. And the right brain function include holistic thoughts, intuition, creativity, art, music, but again, because of the corpus callosum, there is always communication between these hemispheres, right? So they say that uh, people um, whose left uh, half is more developed, they have more um, uh, abilities to learn languages or do math, and people that this kind of like, um, I would not say developed, maybe dominant. Um, right hemisphere, they're more creative, good at music, but I personally um, not really agree with this 100%. But Now, cerebral lobes. So if you look at this um, cerebrum, uh, this upper part of the cerebrum is called cerebral cortex. And cerebral cortex is divided into five lobes. Uh, so frontal, so here's the, uh, it, okay, it's uh, anterior, very big lobe in human. Then we have parietal lobe, we have occipital lobe, we have temporal lobe, 
And there is one more lobe. It's under the temporal lobe. So you see how you need to kind of pull apart um, this uh, frontal, parietal, and temporal. And you will see um, lobe inside called insula. So this is our five lobes of the uh, cerebrum. So here's some vocabulary that we need to know. Uh, sulcus. Sulcus is a groove or furrow on brain surface. For example, we have central sulcus, it's right here. Uh, uh, or we have a lateral sulcus, it's right there. Um, so if you look at this um, uh, picture here, you can see that your brain is not flat. So it has these ridges, right? And then it has those grooves. Um, so the sulcus, it's a groove. And the gyros is a, um, um, those ridges. So gyros are regions between grooves. Um, now, um, example, uh, precentral gyros. So if a sulcus is this line, right, then the gyros is this hill, right? So this part. When we have a deep sulcus, we call it fissure. For example, longitudinal fissure, or we can we have also transverse fissure. Um, Precentral and postcentral uh, gy gyri. Uh, frontal and parietal lobes are separated by line called central sulcus. So you see this line over here, that's a central sulcus. The, the area immediately in front of the central sulcus this one is called precentral gyrus, and this is a part of frontal lobe. The area immediately behind the central sulcus called postcentral gyrus, and this is part of parietal lobe. Now, why is this going to uh, why it's important? Because postcentral gyrus, this is where you have what it's called sensory cortex, and precentral gyrus, this is motor cortex. So, for example, if somebody touches your uh, arm or your shoulder, this information about touch goes to postcentral gyrus. But if you want to move your fingers or you want to move your arm, this um, uh, signal start at precentral gyrus. Uh, so, cerebrum function. Gray matter of uh, cerebrum is called cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex responsible for receiving sensory data and making sense of the data, create voluntary motion, speech, skeletal muscle movements, and processing uh, centers like critical thinking, multitasking, memory, and etc. Uh, occipital lobe. Um, Occipital lobe, that's the one that is uh, at the back of your brain, right? It's posterior part of the brain. Receive sensory data from your eyes, visual data, and make sense of the data. Example, you look at the object in front of you. You know that you can see the object, and you uh, you know, is it a friend? Is it a, some object like clock, table, etc. Right? For you to be able to see, and understand what you think, you have your occipital lobe. A stroke in the occipital lobe, um, and stroke is um, when a part of the brain uh, tissue dies. And it's um, because of the uh, blood supply. Either we, we have different type of strokes. But anyway, when, uh, the, when um, because stroke is cerebr cerebrovascular accident. So when your blood vessels, for example, are blocked and you uh, your occipital lobe doesn't receive enough oxygen, uh, it can go into stroke. Um, so stroke and occipital lobe could either cause blindness or loss of ability to recognize object because that's, um, that's the function is to see and recognize the object. Uh, parietal lobe. Now, parietal lobe is superior part, um, and it more it's behind a frontal lobe. Receiving sensory data from your senses of touch and make sense of the data. So it's called some other sensory um, uh, area. Example, if 
you put your hand in the pocket. You feel something in your pocket and you know what you're touching. Is it your key, your wallet, or phone? So these functions, right, are possible because of your parietal lobe. Next temporal lobe, no, temporal lobe are where your ears are, right? Where your temporal bone is. Uh, receiving sensory data from your nose and make sense of the data and receiving sensory data from your ears and make sense of this data. So temporal uh, lobe is uh, uh, for smell and uh, hearing. So for smell, example, some, uh, smelling something and knowing that smell is associated with bread, cookie, or trash, that's due to your um, temporal lobe. Or hearing a noise and associating it with music, ring, or speech, this is also a function of temporal lobe. Insula. Uh, so we already know, um, so here, by the way, here's the parietal. So that's a parietal. That's for um, uh, uh, sensation, right? So this is your occipital for vision. And parietal, what's a sensation? Like touch, if somebody touching you. And this is your temporal, right, over here. That's for um, hearing and smell. And your insula is deep to temporal. Insula has three main functions. Receiving sensory data from your taste buds um, and make sense of this data. Um, a sense of balance, vestibular sense, and responsible for processing internal sensation. For, for example, sensation from your stomach, from your uh, urinary bladder, like stomach ache or full bladder, right? So here's three functions of insula. Uh, taste, balance, and sensation from internal organs. And here's our frontal lobe. So frontal lobe is pretty large in human and um, uh, it's responsible for creation of voluntary movement, skeletal muscle movement. This is our precentral gyrus, eye movement, uh, speech, uh, speech creation, uh, muscle memory. Uh, plus, frontal lobe is actually where your personality is, where uh, you have a decision-making uh, uh, center. Uh, you decide what to eat for breakfast. When you study for your test, you use your frontal lobe. Plus, you can see it's, uh, it's uh, lots of movement, like movement of skeletal muscle, eye movement, movement of your tongue, creating of speech and memory of your muscles. Uh, so um, in uh, the function um, higher... Uh, level thinking that I just told you, like your personality, uh, your decision making. This is part of the frontal lobe and it's called prefrontal cortex. Uh, this is the processing center involved in memory, critical thinking, multitasking, multitasking, testing, multitasking, testing. So you make several things together, right? So you can, for example, uh, watch TV and, I don't know, eat at the same time. Uh, solving problems, development of characteristic and behavioral patterns based on social environment. So this is your, uh, this is your personality. Right? So this is cool. It's a part of frontal lobe. It is called prefrontal cortex. Okay, uh, so here's our prefrontal cortex, right? And this is still up to this uh, blue part, right? This is all frontal lobe, but this is your prefrontal cortex. This is your motor cortex in a uh, precentral gyrus. This is your sensory cortex, a uh, postcentral gyrus. Um, this is called Broca's area that allow you to uh, speak. And Broca's area found only on the left side, left hemisphere. Okay, now then we're moving to diencephalon. Okay, so diencephalon includes several parts, but we only looking at thalamus and hypothalamus. So uh, this structure look like an egg. That's a thalamus, and just below the thalamus is hypothalamus. Or you can see here, thalamus and that's a hypothalamus. So thalamus, um, 
A thalamus receives signals from all senses and directs them to the right region of the cerebral cortex. It sorts out the sensory data, also known as gateway to central cortex. So all sensory information goes to thalamus first, then a thalamus will send it to the right area of the cerebral cortex. There is only one information that doesn't go to the thalamus and goes straight to the cortex, and this is a smell. So smell goes to the temporal lobe first and then goes to the thalamus, but still all sensory information will go through thalamus. Now hypothalamus, that is um, shown over here, so that's inferior part of the um, dencephalon. It helps maintain homeostasis, regulate sleep, hunger, thirst, body temperature, controls release of hormone from pituitary gland, and here's the pituitary gland right there, and uh, control sex drive and pleasure. Um, next part of the brain, uh, cerebellum, so it's right here. It's inferior part of the brain underneath cerebrum. It controls balance, muscle movement, and coordination. Essential for creating coordinated and smooth uh, motion skeletal muscles. Uh, note that lack of control and coordination in babies is related to a developing cerebellum. So you know how babies, um, when they very little, they have hard time to coordinate their uh, movement of their arms or legs. They just, they move them, right? But they cannot grab object yet, for example. So that's because their um, cerebellum is still in developing state. Um, now we're moving to brain stem. Uh, brain stem is made of midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. So here's the midbrain, most superior part, pons, and medulla. And, uh, uh, and on the top of the midbrain, we have the thalamus. So here you can see on this picture, uh, midbrain, pons, uh, oh, sorry, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, and above, that's our diencephalon, and specifically what sits on the midbrain is thalamus. So midbrain, uh, adjust the uh, sensitivity of eyes to light and ear to sound. Pons, bridge between brain and spinal cord, secondary uh, respiration center. Medulla oblongata, regulation of heartbeat, vasoconstriction, so it's a primary cardiovascular center, vasoconstriction and vasodilation centers. That means the centers that regulate um, constriction and dilation of your blood vessels located in the medulla. Also regulation of breathing, it's a primary respiratory center, reflex center for vomiting, hiccuping, swallowing, and coughing. Um, limbic system. Now, limbic system is physiological system. Uh, it, it includes part of the, uh, let's say, it's cerebrum and diencephalon, right? So this small um, limbic is more physiological uh, system. So it has, um, it, it includes uh, several parts like a thalamus, hypothalamus, olfactory bulb. Those are part of limbic system. Control over self um gratifying uh, behaviors such as hunger, thirst, sexual desire, connect primitive emotions to mental functions. Example, unpleasant sensation or emotions to stress, eating or sexual behavior as pleasurable. So limbic system is called your um, emotional center, right? So this uh, give you, um, um, this um, give you, for example, amygdala. Um, amygdala is uh, responsible in uh, uh, fear, in a uh, feeling of fear. So when you're afraid of something, hippocampus, that's uh, memory, right? It's also a way you have your pleasure. Um, and for example, when you eat or when you have some sexual uh, intercourse that um, you feel like a pleasurable activity, that's because of the limbic system, right? Okay. Uh, sub, uh, so here we will talk a little bit about brain injury. So subdural uh, hemorrhage. Uh, well, hemorrhage is bleeding. So it's bleeding from ruptured vessels into intracranial space, and it causes compression of brain tissue. Person is originally lucid, 
as blood accumulates, loss of speech, uh, unconsciousness, loss of uh, control, uh, uh, heart rate, uh, respiration, blood pressure. And treatment is drill the hole to remove the blood and fix the ruptured blood vessel. So if you, uh, you have a blood vessel that supply brain, if you have a rupture, then the blood will leak out. It will leak out into cranial cavity. And this blood will push on, um, so you see that's, uh, it's, so it pushes on the brain, uh, compresses the brain tissue, and it can cause, of course, death. Um, uh, that's, this is our stroke, uh, or cerebrovascular accident. Uh, so when blood circulation to an area of brain is limited and brain tissue dies, uh, causes a paralysis of the opposite side of the body's sense um, of the body sensory uh, deficits and loss of speech. Um, so um, so here's the blood vessels that uh, supply blood. Uh, and in this situation, blood vessel is ruptured. So this is called hemorrhagic stroke. Um, the blood vessels rupture and blood leaks into the uh, cranial cavity and um, the part of the brain dies. Uh, in this situation, we have a, a blood clot uh, or some maybe um, or, uh, like cholesterol that plugs and uh, closes the uh, artery. Then it's called ischemic stroke. So ischemic means low oxygen. So when we have a blood vessel that is blocked, is it's a blood clot or it's some, um, you know, um, other like a plug, cholesterol plug, right? Then um, tissue don't get, don't receive, tissue doesn't receive enough oxygen and it's go into ischemic state and that's called ischemic stroke. Now, if let's say, um, if the patient is uh, doesn't have sensation or it's paralyzed on the right side, that means left par, uh, side of the brain is damaged. If patient has paralysis or loss of sensation on the left side of the body, then the right part of the brain is affected. Right, that it says post paralysis to the opposite side of the body. Alzheimer disease. Uh, it's degenerative brain disease uh, that causes memory loss, uh, shortened attention span, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, it's not. Uh, it, it's not something that caused by virus or uh, uh, bacteria, right? This is just um, degeneration of brain, usually related to the age. Like every organ in your body um changes when you get older the same happened with a uh, brain some people have a predisposition for alzheimer's diseases but some never have but um they it can it can happen when they get uh, older uh, <clears throat> so what happens that protein plugs build up in the brain slowly uh, and they kill neurons uh, slow spreads that create various stages of the disease. Uh, so here uh, you can see advanced Alzheimer's disease, and you can compare a uh, healthy brain with Alzheimer's brain. So it's get uh, smaller, and the amount of the brain tissue decreases. So here's the um, coronal section of normal brain and Alzheimer, and um, here you can see comparison. But again, this is advanced stage. Uh, and that you see how uh, you see lots of changes in the brain tissue because those neurons just die. And of course, it's affect many function, including the memory uh, loss. But because brain can coordinates pretty much all your activity, that will it means that uh, many uh, body functions will be affected. Okay, and I believe this was uh, no. Uh, we have three more slides, sorry. Uh, yeah, spinal cord. So uh, spinal cord injury, let me see. Um, and first, what is the spinal cord? It's communication highway between a uh, peripheral nervous system and brain. So you see this line, those are um, nerves. So nerves bring a signal to a spinal cord and spinal cord uh, 
send it to the brain or brain sends signals through the spinal cord to this nurse and nurse takes this signal uh, to muscles. It's uh, bi-directional. So messages from bo body to brain and messages from brain to body. So brain controls our limbs by passing signals through spinal cord. So we have uh, nerves, they branch from spinal cord. We have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. They emerge from either side of spinal cord. So if the spinal cord and the nerves goes left and right. If spinal cord is severed, uh, it means it's cut, then communication is gone. That will cause loss of sensation and loss of muscle movement, the loss of muscle movement if this paralysis. Injury in the thoracic region affects low body uh, region of the body, and it's called paraplegia. And injury in the neck region of the spinal cord affects upper and low regions of the body and called quadriplegia. So here I'll show you on a picture. So, um, so here's your um, vertebral column, right? And inside you have your uh, spinal cord. So if we have lesion, in a cervical region, then uh, the patient have uh, quadriplegia. That means both arms and legs are affected. And what will be affected? No movement and no sensation. But if there is a damage below cervical, right, either in um, thoracic or lumbar, then only low limbs will be affected. So it will be paralysis of low body part and no sensation, and this is called paraplegia, right? So now that this is the last slide um, in this uh, lecture. Thank you for watching, and I hope it was helpful.